Michael here? Yeah. Is uh, uh, someone have a green band? Green or black? Uh, the lights on. Did you ever go out and take the light off? What's 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 the matter? It was a green. There was a green band that said they had the light. The light. Their lights were on. But I looked out and your yours goes out on their own, right? Uh, mine's right down here, the black one. Here. I showed that off. Check it out. Yeah, I didn't see your lights on. Your lights said was My lights been out for a long time. You <laughs> 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 just don't want to have anybody uh, you know, go out and have a dead battery when they're on the way. You know that new van I got when you turn the accessory on and run? I, my wife went into Walmart for a short period. Turned the accessory on and ran a radio, sorry, and the battery went dead. I never had wow. a vehicle ever. I mean, usually, you put the accessory on, you, you sit there for hours and yeah. I don't know what that. And well, you took the uh, there's an anti corrosion unit on there, and Brother Hagman. When I was sick, I didn't drive the vehicle for about two weeks, and I went out to try to go somewhere, and it was dead, and I couldn't figure it out. And he figured out it was an anti. They have an anti rust thing that runs on the battery okay. so he took that off but that that's a weird vehicle for that kind of thing anyway okay so we prayed upstairs right yep okay anybody else coming uh, is Lee is Lee Minnick not here Lee's not here tonight uh Evel will be down after she comes tonight okay the banker for the little kids tonight. Okay. Most of the adults will be down here except the ones that are working with the kids. Okay, well let's have a word of prayer and uh, we'll begin. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness to us and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. We're thankful for your presence with us tonight. Lord, humble us before you. Help us to realize who we bow our heads before this night. And Lord, we need to be overwhelmed with your presence. We ask that we would uh, know your presence and that we would uh, serve you and do your will. We thank you for each one who's come tonight to the church that names your name and loves you. We thank you for those upstairs who are getting ready for their presentation. We pray that would be done for your glory and honor and that you would direct up there. And then, Lord, that you would help us here to be drawn closer to you who we cannot see. We, we know are real and, and uh, we pray that we'd learn of you and be drawn closer to each other as we become brothers and sisters in Christ. We ask and pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be here, and I didn't get a chance to say that. I've been here for a few weeks, uh, but I miss my church very much, and you should miss your church very much. The church in this day and age is really taken very uh, sleazily by many, but it's, uh, if you read your Bible, it's the heartbeat of God. Jesus said, I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. There, there's much in the New Testament about God's church. We take it very lightly. You know, when you get saved, the first step of obedience is baptism to show and testify that you have died to yourself, being buried in Christ and risen again to new life. You're identifying with His death, burial, and resurrection. When you get baptized, it's a public event where it's a testimony to that end that Christ has transformed your life. And initially, after that, you join the church. I never could see why somebody who was part of the body of Christ would have any kind of uh, opposition to joining the church. Now, you need to know that God led you to a particular church, and you need to read your Bible and pray, and uh, God will direct you. You need to find the church that is closest that you can figure to the New Testament pattern, that is teaching and preaching the Word of God as it should. But if you find a perfect church, don't join it. You'll ruin it. Amen? Somebody told me years ago, and that's about true. Brother Bissell has recently said that you're not going to find the perfect church, and that's a fact. But you need to find a church where you hear biblical doctrine being taught, and uh, not entertainment, as we have so much of in this day and age, which Brother Bissell and I came out of, most of you know that. Uh, but I love my church, and I miss my church when I had been that sick. If You, you may not be able to notice my stomach at first glance, but if if you uh, if you look at it, I look like probably a lot of guys that are running around me. Some of you guys, I mean, you you guys think you bested me a little bit. So 
There's a lot of guys running around with a, a belly that sticks out over their belt. But I didn't get mine from eating good food. I mean, overnight, something happened to me. I don't know what happened. I, I really don't know. They call it mesenteric paniculitis, whatever that is. That's a name that the medical field has come up with. They know nothing about mesenteric paniculitis. They don't know where it comes from, why it's here. They have no uh, medicine for it. They try uh, prednisone, but uh, it didn't work for me at all. Uh, and there are some other drugs that are more harmful than uh, even that could be to you that uh, they recommended that I didn't even try, figuring it wouldn't help me. But uh, my waist went from a 36 to a 47 overnight. And what happened when that happened is there's a membrane around your stomach, your intestines, and your colon. There's a membrane that the fatty tissue gets inflamed. It's, it's around your stomach. It's not in my stomach. I can eat and, and, and like that. But uh, the membrane around my stomach has a fatty tissue that is inflamed. That's why they try prednisone because it's an anti-inflammatory. Tori Gene takes it for uh, rheumatoid arthritis. But it didn't work for me. Anyway, uh, uh, you can tell I'm on the level, the bubble's in the middle, amen? <laughs> you carpenters will get that next week by a grape. Anyway, yeah. I look like a pregnant woman if I took my shirt off. I'm not going to do that to show you. <laughs> and along with that uh, big stomach came, a, came the feeling. It's a feeling like as if somebody put a blood pressure band from here to my, from my chest to my groin here and, and pumped it up like they put it around your arm and they pumped it all the way up and they got it pumped up but they won't let it go and that's how I've been since July. I have a squeezing feeling like somebody's squeezing me. I've told some of you that, some of you already know that. Uh, along with that in the beginning came extreme uh, pain in my kidney and my back and my side which my wife made my wife think I had uh, kidney infection when they took me to the urgent care to, Check that out. But uh, when, I, when I got to the urgent care, uh, the lady took my blood pressure and said to me, Mr. Carty, are you taking your high blood pressure medicine? I said, ma'am, I don't have high blood pressure. She said, yes, you do. It's 197 over 109. Wow. And I didn't feel funny or anything, but I said, whoa. And uh, they said it could be from the, uh, the disease that took hold of me and the pain. They put me on high blood pressure medication for a while and then uh, now I'm off of that, and my blood pressure seems to be back in somewhat uh, normal fashion. But uh, in the beginning, I wasn't able to stand for long periods of time. I would have had to sit. I think I'm, I'm going to try to stand because I want to try. To, I'm trying to work this thing out. I'm trying to get the, the bad out of me. But uh, I couldn't stand. I couldn't walk too far, or too long, and uh, it gives you an extreme what they call uh, uh, they call it malaise is what you get, which is severe tiredness. So I fall asleep up here tonight, you'll forgive me. I'm only kidding. But it makes me feel whooped, very, very tired. And uh, that's, that's the way it's been for me for a little bit. My doctor has been in practice for over 25 years. He said he's only seen one other case of what they're calling mesenteric paniculitis. It's very rare. It usually comes to old men, which I plead guilty of, the first degree. And uh, that's usually who gets it. Yeah, but there's not really much pattern or rhyme or reason to it. So I appreciate so much your prayers. Uh, many of you prayed and many of you sent me cards. And, and I never realized <clears throat> how much it means to get one of those little cards until I started getting them. <laughs> and Alan May, and they sent me a half a dozen cards, I believe they did. And bless their hearts, they're not here tonight. But uh, pray for them. May fell just recently. Some of you probably know that. And she hurt her hip. I think she's doing fair to Midland right now. She's home, though, uh, recuperating. And uh, so, uh, but anyway, uh, I appreciate your prayers, and I appreciate your cards, and I appreciate you thinking about me while I was not here, but it's so good to be here. I want you to turn your Bible, if you will, tonight to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we're going to read 1 through 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1 through 8. Familiar passage probably to many of you. Precious passage to my heart. And I would even call this message a sermon for me tonight, if, if I might. Uh, but there's more to it than that. I'll read uh, the passage from verse 1 to verse 8. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick or the living and the dead, at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. 
For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered in the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that also love his appearing. And uh, so... Though it always doesn't come easy to me, and uh, I fought, I fought it for a while many years ago when God first began to confirm in my heart that He was calling me to preach. My wife will tell you I used to pace the floor and go round and round and round and say I'm not supposed to do this. I know from whence I came. I'm not supposed to be a, a preacher for God. And these people would call me churches and want me to come and come to youth rallies and come to meet. Back then the phone was ringing off the hook because I went to Baptist Bible College and they had put my testimony out in a couple of their flyers and stuff. And these preachers were trying to get me to come. And I told them when they first called, I said, I am not a preacher. I never, I didn't want to be a preacher. I, I knew from whence I came. I knew God could not use guys like me to be a preacher. There's no way, shape, or form that could ever happen. And uh, little do you know, some of you, some of you heard stories, but... It's a marvelous miracle that Brother Bissell and I, and he is such a blessing to me, uh, are doing what we're doing today. It's by the grace of God, and it's a miracle. And uh, anyone who is genuinely called of God to uh, preach his word is it's a miraculous thing. Nobody just wants to do that naturally. It doesn't come natural. And so I fought that thing for many, many years, and... and uh, the Lord was confirming in my life back then and uh, changing things in my life drastically. But uh, today I just love to study. I love to preach. I never loved to study when I was younger. I, I got straight D's in high school because my teachers used to come hear me perform in the nightclubs when I was playing the nightclub circuit. That's the only reason I got D's. I, I didn't do anything. I didn't even go to class. But they passed me through. A public school is a farce. It was where I came from anyway. And my teachers just put me through because they liked me. And, that, and maybe another guy wouldn't have made it uh, in the same predicament that I was in. But uh, I didn't like to study. I didn't like to read. I couldn't read the back of an album cover, though. I love music. I, I, I didn't like to read. But when I got saved, God had me to begin to read profusely. I, I, I read all the time. I love to read. I love to study. <clears throat> I love to preach His Word. And uh, I thank God for the 43 years that I've spent in the ministry preaching across this country and the Lord's allowed me to be in Australia a little bit. Some of you knew that. I was in Jamaica. I had at one time a lot of Noah wants me to come to Africa, but I don't know. I don't know. He, he, he I don't know. <laughs> that scares me a little bit. And Brother Bishop went to the Philippines a little bit, but I had many missionaries that wanted me to come. And I believe that's what an evangelist is to do. He's to labor within the local church. He's not to go to a citywide crusade ministry and, and, uh, you leave the church. The evangelist is a gift to the local church. And again, I'm going to say God's heartbeat is the church. And Christian people just don't have a hold of that. They, they won't join the church. And by the way, nobody should be serving God in and through any local church that is not a member of the local church. If you can't obey God and be obedient, you're a member of the body of Christ. You should desire to be part of his church. And I desire that. Now, again, you need to know that God wants you in any specific church, and, and I'm not talking to newcomers here. Most of you have been here for a while. But uh, you need to know that God wants you there. When you find out that's where God wants you, you join, you get busy serving Him. Amen? And it's very important. It's very important not to take it light. And uh, you don't leave churches without some kind of a direction from God, and the only way He speaks to you to tell you to do something like that is through His Word. He doesn't speak out of the sky or by some emotions or by some uh, association that you have. He speaks to you through his word. You have to be in it. Study to show thyself approved unto who? Unto God. Workmen that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so I'm so thankful that God has allowed me to proclaim his word for these 43 years that I have. My schedule is not as busy as it once was. But uh, the Lord still opens doors here and there, and uh, I still have opportunities to preach. And even so, He has met our every need and taken care of us over the years. Uh, 
people ask me, I just had a preacher call, call me just recently that I preached for in the Adirondack Mountains up in, in New York State there. He said, you still, are you still preaching? I said, well, that's, that's what I do. <laughs> the gifts and calling of God are without repentance, I read in the book somewhere. Amen? Amen. I mean, I get kind of bent out of shape. These guys, one minute God called them to be a pastor, the next thing they, they have trouble in the church. So now they're going to be an evangelist, and so now they think they're going to you know, travel down the road and, and skip all those problems in the church. Then they, they, they see what the road's all about. Then they're going to be a Christian school teacher, and then they're going to be a Bible college professor. And, and God's fickle in his calling. Amen? But what I find is God's not fickle. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. He doesn't change his mind. Yeah. And uh, I said, if, you know, if I, if I end up preaching in the cornfield, Brother Hartwig, I, I told him, I said, that's what I'll do. If, yeah. if, that's, if that's where I end up, that's what I'll do. But that's what I do, Brother Hartwig, and I still do that wherever they'll have me to come. Yeah. I'm reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul as I consider these words I'm saying to you. Keep a marker in 2 Timothy 4, but I want you to look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. Through 13. I'm reminded of Paul's testimony where he says, According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. That's an overwhelming statement. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. You don't just get your cards printed and say, I'm pastor so-and-so or I'm evangelist so-and-so like so many people want to do. They want to do it like a performer, you see. God... God must call you. He must put you in the ministry. We have a lot of mommy sent daddy called preachers in this country that can't make it. They don't make it. But when God calls you, you'll keep on keeping on. You'll keep doing what he wants you to do when you know his hand is upon you. And uh, verse 13, who was before, and this is what I'm saying in this little thing I'm saying in the introduction here, who was before, he's talking about himself, a what? Blasphemer. Blasphemer and a persecutor. And injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Amen, amen, amen. I thank God for the forgiveness that we have in Christ Jesus. Amen? amen. Look at Galatians 1.15 along these lines. I want to show you some things Paul said. He said it many times. Galatians 1.15, but when it pleased God, who did what? Separated me from my mother's womb and what? called me by His grace. That's an overwhelming statement. Overwhelming statement. And uh, it brings me to tears when I meditate on that as to what God has done. And as I've already said, I'm so blessed uh, by my brother, Brother Bissell. I've seen many musicians. I, I was one of the first to get saved out of that uh, insane lifestyle. And many, many others followed suit and made professions. I could give you probably a half a dozen or a dozen, maybe, I don't know, at least, who made professions, but every one of them was tainted by their old life, either by entering into Christian rock and roll or, or falling away or whatever. But, you know, <clears throat> Brother Bissell really got saved, amen. And what a blessing that is to me. Oh, you, you know, you, you, you could find fault with him. He's a sinner saved by grace. But you better thank God for a man like him. You don't know from whence he came. You don't know what he was. I mean, there was a time when he told me he was called to preach and he was going to go to seminary after graduating with a Bachelor of Sacred Music degree from Bible College. I prayed with him, but I went out of his house and talking to the Lord and saying, Lord, he's crazy. I'm going to be a preacher. I mean, you know, I mean, he couldn't find his way out of a shopping center, let alone lead a church. I mean, he's a genius musically. I bless his heart. I've known him for years since he's a little kid. And he was the youngest member of my band. And when I brought him into my band, my band members didn't even want him to come. They knew how old he was. He was only, I think, 15 years old or 16 years old in high school when he came with us on the road. And he used to go back and forth from, from the, from the uh, gigs we were playing to go to school. But they didn't even want him to come to rehearsal. They said he's too young. But when I brought him in there and he played, they wanted him. And uh, so we, we used him. He's a genius musically. But I, and preach. He was very, he never a guy you'd ever think would preach. No, not you see, you didn't know him. I knew him. And what a blessing it is when I, when I talk about it, it makes me want to cry because you'd never in, in, in a million years think he would preach. Am I right? Yeah. But what a preacher. What a blessing he is to my heart and ought to be to yours. Cool. But anyway, uh, Paul says, It pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb. And that's what God did in Brother Bissell's life, I'm sure, as I'm standing here. And I believe that's what he did in my life. And that's why... 
uh, he'll keep on keeping on. He'll remain and uh, keep on doing what God's called him to do. He knows the Lord. He's definitely saved. And uh, whatever comes upon him, I remember when his father died, and I thought he was going to, I thought he was going to be gone. It was only about a month after he was saved. He just moved up here to go to Bible college. And when his dad had a stroke, diabetic stroke, he said to me, I know God's just dealing with him because we had witness to him quite, quite head on and fervently. And uh, his father really heard the clear presentation of the gospel. And I knew that God didn't have to raise him. My brother Bishop told me, he says, God is just using this stroke in his life. And uh, he's going to bring him back, and he's going to save him. And I prayed, Lord, please do that. And it was about two weeks later, I got the phone call that he went to, home, he went to eternity. And I, I was driving to Brother Business House telling the Lord, what in the world? Are you he's going to go back and rock and roll. Lord, I'm telling the Lord how to do what he's supposed to be doing. I'm praying. I didn't mean to be doing that, but that's what I was doing. I was very upset and figured he was going to leave and not go on to Bible college. When I got to his house and knocked on his door, and uh, he opened the door, and I began to weep. And he said, it's all right, Brother Carney. God knows what he's doing. Wow. I mean, he was only safe for just a short time. And uh, he didn't quit. Matter of fact, he wrote that little song that some of you sung. At that time, he went in the Scripture to find some solace from God. And he read about Peter. And uh, Peter said to to whom shall we go, Lord? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Amen. Where are we going to go? Yeah. When somebody's saved, uh, that's the kind of attitude they'll have. And Scripture will work in their life. This is very real. Christianity is real. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10 along these lines also. I didn't get to the message yet. Maybe we'll have to wait till next week to get to that. 1 Corinthians 15, 9, Paul says, For I am what? The least. The least of the apostles. You see, when you get saved, God humbles you. He squashes you. You come to realize that you're zero. And you come to realize that He is everything. When you really get saved, I don't mean when you walk an aisle and say a little prayer in the back room. I mean when the God of heaven saves you. He arrests you in your tracks. You have your Damascus Road experience as I preached here before. And you better have had one. And when you do, you'll know who He is. And you'll know that you're nothing. The great Apostle Paul, who we would consider as great, said, I am the least of the apostles, that I, that I that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Amen, amen, amen. What a wonderful passage, amen. These are wonderful, wonderful passages in Scripture. And then Ephesians 3.8. Ephesians 3.8 Unto me who am less than the least of all saints less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should what? Preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And then I want you to look at a lengthy passage in Colossians if you will. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12 and we're going to read all the way down to verse 29. And I want you to pay attention to what we're reading. Colossians 1.12, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his what? Blood. Blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Look in every other translation of the Bible that exists, except the King James Bible, and that verse is not there. They'll tell you the best manuscripts omit it. Well, no manuscript should omit it. It's the Word of God. Amen? Amen. And their argument, when these uh, highfalutin scholars come around for their other translations, is in another place it can be found something very similar. Well, I really don't care. This verse is in the Bible. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of the sin. Uh, uh, even the forgiveness of sin. My friend, without the shedding of blood, there is no, what? Remission. Remission of sin. Very important passage. Verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him, that is Christ, were all things created that are in heaven. That are in earth, visible, invisible, whether it be thrones, dominions, or principalities or powers, 
all things were created by him and for him. And he, he is before all things. And by him all things consist. That means are held together. They're held together. Uh, scientists can tell you that, you know, that this is made out of wood or particle board or whatever it's made out of. But they can't tell you what causes it to stay together and hold together in this world of flux and change and, and everything's moving and changing. They can't tell you why that is like that. I can tell you. By him, all things consist, are held together and have their existence. And uh, it says here, he is before all things also. Verse 18. And he is the head of the what? The body. The, body, the what? The Listen, gang. This is God's church. You listen to me good. You see this basement, this fellowship hall? This is God's fellowship hall. Belongs to God. Doesn't belong to Pastor Bissell. Doesn't belong to some social club. Some little hokey pokey uh, social church that some people have. This is God's church. That little nursery upstairs, that's God's nursery. That belongs to God. And you guys ought not fritter and flutter and pick on each other and holler and scream about whatever goes on in this little fellowship hall or the nursery or any part of this church. It's His church. It's God's church. We need to submit to Him. He's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead. That in all things He might have what? Now, gang, be honest. Does he have, that means first place. He got first place in every, every uh, function of this building. I hope he does. He got first place in your heart, first of all. And then everything you do in this church, every ministry you have, everything you touch in this church, you remember he has preeminence in all things. You've got to remember that because it's so easy for us sinners to forget that. This is his church. That's his pole. That's his wall. That's his floor. That's his drop ceiling. It all belongs to him. I could go on and on and on with every minutia of thing in this building. It's his church. You say, God's not in a building or in a temple. That's right. We have the church universal, which we're a part of. But he raised up the local church. And that's part of his program. And it's very important to him. I know it's not very important to you because most Christians I travel around this country don't seem to have any concept of the importance of God's local church, which is a reflection of the universal church. It's supposed to be a part, a reflection of that universal church. It says here, For it pleased the Father that in Him should dwell, should all the fullness dwell. Verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, by Him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Amen. That ought to bring you to tears. That ought to bring you to tears. You ought to weep. That's amazing. You see, he did that work in you. You had nothing to do with it. Verse 22, In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Whoo! Man, that's something. That blesses my heart. Verse 23, if you continue, if, that's conditional, you continue in the faith, if you continue in the faith, and so many. I just preached a five series message on apostasy here in this church. We called it, they come and they go. And I just preached on it. And you can, you can I don't know if it's on the internet or not. Is that on the internet? Is that on the church uh, website? I don't believe it is. Well, it ought to be. You've got to get busy. <laughs> well, I no, it's, it's okay. Ah. <laughs> apostasy those who fall away they come and they go and it's, it was quite revealing as I found some of the old uh, um, what do they call them uh, the old uh, what do you call them things where all the people are listed oh, the registry, registry of the registry church, of the church members yeah. or whatever it is yeah. and we saw the uh, in and out and how they come and they go but anyway if you continue in the faith and I hope you all do they all don't you know <laughs> They go out from us because they were not of us. That happens. We preach that in that message on apostasy. And that's the way it is. But if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. You see, he's made a minister. And I believe Brother Bissell is made a minister. I believe that's what God did in my life. 
It's supernatural Amen. that I would be here before you doing what I'm doing here tonight. Verse 24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the what? Church. You see how precious that is to him? Amen. He says he rejoices in his sufferings for him. He's talking about different sufferings than I just had, but I've just been through some sufferings. And I don't want to play a violin. Some of you have been through worse than me, I'm sure. But whereof I am made, verse 25, made a minister. And that's my point. True men of God are made men of God by God. As this is God's church, Brother Bissell is God's man. God made him. I'm sure as I'm standing here. There ain't no way, shape, or form he'd ever do what he'd do naturally. It's supernatural. I just want to encourage you and remind you. He loves the Lord. He loves the Word of God. He studies. And he gives you sound doctrine from the Word of God every time he preaches in this church. He said, I'm made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. See? Yeah. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. That minister, uh, mystery is the church. Yeah. To whom God would make, make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, the indwelling spirit is a church, is a New Testament doctrine. Yeah. Whom we, verse 28, preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. That's an overwhelming, awesome responsibility that we as preachers have. And you've got to pray for men who got feet of clay, just men saved by the grace of God, <clears throat> who we need to warn every man. We are commanded to do that. We are to teach every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That's why James chapter 3 says, Be not many teachers and leaders among you. Greater is the condemnation to them. I shudder every time I read that passage. By the grace of God, I'll hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant someday, but that remains to be seen. Verse 29. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Notice, it's his working. It's all Him. It is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. You wouldn't want to do anything this book said, and you wouldn't do anything this book said, near would I, if it wasn't by the grace of God and the Spirit of God that directs us. And we as Christians, who are really Christians, need to realize that the, f the flesh is weak. And uh, that we have a constant battle going on. We need to com continue to submit to the Word of God. Christians can make mistakes, but they won't remain belligerent and cocky and proud in the face of the Word of God and deny it and do what they want to do in their own will, in their own flesh. They will submit to the Word of God if they're in violation of it. Now, I'm excited and enthused about the ministry here at Elkdale Baptist Church. I'm so thankful for what God has done here down through the years. And I look forward with eager expectation, enthusiastic anticipation to what God will be doing here in the future. And I hope all of you good Christian people will be a part of that. Amen. Because we're going to keep on keeping on. No matter what happens, no matter who comes or goes, you say, who are you talking about? If the shoe fits, wear it. Get that message. That's on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> Some of you missed that one. <laughs> You know, let me just give you a little in a nutshell what that's all about. As I travel around this country, I don't know how many people I had come to me. I, hundreds of people, literally. Come to me and say, Brother Carter, come back here. Did my pastor tell you something about me? <laughs> when you came here, was my pastor telling you about, and my name is so-and-so, did my pastor tell you about me? I don't know how many times I've heard people say, well, you stepped right on my toes. Listen, I want you to know that it's not, First of all, it's not Brother Bissell's or my first choice to pick on you. And uh, that's what God does through His Word. It's supernatural. I preach on things I don't even know not of. I didn't know what was going on. And God spoke to somebody and they thought I knew something about them. They couldn't, they couldn't crack it up to God's real and His Word's real and it's supernatural. And He's speaking to me and fall down on their face for Him. they got to find some human element as to why I knew something about them. 
Well, let me add this, and I want to add it emphatically. That message, if the shoe fits, wear it, also said this. I did in that message. If, in fact, I know you are committing a particular sin, I am responsible before God to, yes, call that sin in your face and preach to you what the Word of God says. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what I'm supposed to do. So you're all going to say amen till it's your turn and it's your sin. And then I preach on that matter. And then it ain't going to go down just the same way. But I'm sorry. I've lost a lot of friends over the years. I guess they were friends. They said they were friends at one time. But I'm not going to change. I'm not going to compromise what this book says for you or anybody. I don't care if it's my family. I don't care if it's my friend. I had some friends in this church I hunted with so much and so many hours and spent time in the woods and loved them and and uh, they violated the scriptures and I came head on with them just like I will with you. I'm not trying to be cocky or smart. That's what I have to do. That's what I'm responsible to do before God and Brother Bissell even more so than me as the pastor of this church. Amen, amen, amen. I'm excited about what God's doing here and what he will do. I hope you're all a part of it in days to come. Now, the text is 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 8. Go back there. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead of the superior kingdom, preach the word. The incident, in season, out of season, we already read it. I'm going to skip that reading now because we already read it. But I want you to know that this is a very vital portion of Scripture, especially when one considers that it reflects the very last words of the great Apostle Paul. Some of the last words. Look at verse 6 of the passage. He said, I'm now ready to be offered in the time of my, what? Departure. Departures at hand. So this is a very vital portion of Scripture, especially when we realize that it reflects some of the very last words that he wrote. Not long after this, Paul will be executed. There are at least, uh, these are the last words of Paul, words given to him by Almighty God. And we must also consider the immediate, the immediate recipient of this letter. And these last words of Paul. It's a man, a relatively young man, who is a preacher of the gospel. His name is Timothy. He is an evangelist. Did you hear what I said? Timothy is an evangelist. That's what he did. He's a faithful servant of God and a dear companion of Paul. Now, some people call Timothy and Titus pastoral epistles. That's a mistake. Both Timothy and Titus were evangelists. All the old commentators will tell you that. I have a long uh, treatise here by Albert Barnes as to where the era comes from that these men pastored. They are not pastors. I want to show you in the text first what I'm saying. Paul says to Timothy... But watch thou, verse 5, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do what? The work of an evangelist. The work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Now what Bible scholars and teachers and those who teach what's not biblically correct tell you about that is, they're telling you that Paul's telling Timothy to do some added thing in his ministry. They'll tell you that Timothy's a pastor. And that he's supposed to, as a pastor, do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of his ministry. But I want you to look at that passage. Here's what it says. I want to read it with the emphasis that it should be. Watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, which you are, making full proof of your ministry as an evangelist. You see, these people who advocate this never tell you what the work of an evangelist is. that They'll tell you, well, he's supposed to knock on doors. Well, that's not what an evangelist does. Evangelist, well, he's supposed to give the gospel out. That's not what an evangelist does. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. What for? For the perfecting of the who? The unsaved people? Saints. For the Billy Graham crusade? No. For the perfecting of the what? Saints. Always applied to pastoral ministry, but don't, don't miss it. That ministry is a ministry of the evangelists. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints to the work of the ministry of the divine God of Christ. What was 
Titus told to do. To go to churches that didn't have pastors. Set things in order and ordain elders in every city. An evangelist is an itinerant. He's supposed to work in the local church. You know, the local, I, I preach this so, so many times. People hire these, uh, they call them, I, what do they call them, itinerant pastors? Interim. Interim pastors. Get your concordance here. And interim pastor. Interim, interim, find that for me. Just I in your concordance. Interim <laughs> pastor. Got it in there? Nope. You ain't find no interim nope. pastor. There's no such thing. We just make this stuff up. Do our own things, eh? God raised up the evangelist. He's not just some guy who holds citywide crusades and has some special gift to gab to win everybody to Christ. There's no gift to gab to win anybody to Christ. It's a gift of God that saves people. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the great evangelist that God gave some uh, gift of evangelism to and some great ability, yes or no? no? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by what? The Word of God. The Word of God. It says, uh, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the great evangelist God raised up. You ought to get him to your house and sick him on your kids because he's got that gift of gab. He'll be able to win them to Christ and get them to all your unsaved relatives and friends and, and put him in a big crusade because he can win people to Christ. That's what it says. What's it say? Being born again not of corruptible seed, that means not by the will of man, but of incorruptible seed by not the great evangelist, by what? The Word of God was listening to Bites forever. The Word of God is what transforms lives. That's how God saves people. But He does the save, and He does it through His Word. And we are commanded to preach the Word. Instant in season, out of season, as it said. Now, many of the old Bible scholars believe not only Timothy, but Titus were evangelists. If you read good commentators from the old days, not this modern junk, you'll find that to be taught and be true. And it's true. There's no question about it. That verse says that. Do the work of an evangelist. He's telling him to do what he's... That's his ministry. Make full proof of your ministry. His ministry is he's an evangelist, not a pastor. Okay. And uh, where do they get this other idea? Countless other Bible scholars and commentators, theologians, advocate, advocate and taught that Timothy and Titus were actually pastors. It's most commonly taught that these books are called pastoral epistles. I already said that. The author has heard, or I have heard, educators, Bible college teachers and Bible college professors refer to Timothy as a model pastor. They go on to say that Paul, in this portion of his letter to Timothy, was uh, exhorting Timothy to add to his pastoral duties another kind of work, quote-unquote, the work of an evangelist. But what's never really clear is to actually what this work of an evangelist was. They can't ever figure it out. They puddle around and stumble along and say, well, winning souls, knocking on doors. and uh, But that's not what it's teaching at all. And uh, that's what Timothy was supposed to accomplish while he was making full proof of his pastoral ministry according to these teachers. But it's an error. This error is entertained, advocated, and encouraged largely because of a spurious note which appears at the end of the book of 2 Timothy and also Titus. It's probably in your Bible. You probably have a little note there. You may or may not. Most Bibles put it in. Barnes dealt with that note emphatically in his, Tim, uh, his commentary on Timothy, and it ought to be read by anybody who has a concern. But the note in 2 Timothy dogmatically states, the second epistle unto Timotheus ordained the first bishop of the church of the Ephesians. Does your Bible say that? You got a little note there? says it was written from Rome when Paul was brought before Nero the second time. It's in many, many, many Bibles. It may or may not be there. It's usually printed. The book of Titus has a similar subscription, which was also dogmatic in its statement, and it says, it says it, this book was written to Titus, ordained the first birth bishop of the church of the Cretans from Nicopolis to Macedonia. In the last paragraph of his excellent commentary on 2 Timothy, the great commentator Albert Barnes informs us concerning these notes. Listen carefully. The subscription to this epistle was not added by Paul himself, nor is there any evidence that it was by an inspired man. And it is of no authority. There is not the slightest evidence that Timothy was, quote-unquote, ordained the first bishop of the church of the Ephesians, or that he was a, quote-unquote, bishop there at all. There's no reason to believe that he was ever a pastor there in the technical sense. And then Barnes says to compare his remarks 
on the subscriptions to the Epistle of Romans, chapter one and First Corinthians, or Romans rather, the Book of Romans and First Corinthians, and especially in Titus, where he does uh, a exhaustive uh, note there. I would deem it not only valuable but also necessary for the Christian person, all of you, to consider all of Albert Barnes' remarks at the end of the other books of the New Testament that are mentioned, Romans, 1 Corinthians, Titus, and Timothy. The note from the book of Romans says the subscription written to the Romans is evidently added by some other hand, but by whom is unknown. Paul assuredly would not write this to inform the Romans that it was sent by Phoebe, whom he had just commended to their kindness. It has been shown, moreover, that no reliance is to be placed on any of the subscriptions to the epistles. Some of them are known to be false. By whom they were added is totally unknown. In this case, in Romans, the fact which it states is indeed correct, that it was written from Corinth and sent by Phoebe. That is true, but the note is not necessarily valid. Again, Barnes notes on the subscription at the end of the book of 1 Corinthians, there is not the slightest internal evidence that it was written from Philippi. But everything in the epistle concurs that the supposition that it was sent from Epis, in the, excuse me, but everything in the epistle concurs in the su supposition that it was sent from Ephesus, not Philippi. There is, however, a considerable variety among the manuscripts in regard to the subscription, and there are evidently none of them of any authority, and as these subscriptions generally mislead the reader of the Bible, it would have been better had they been omitted and left out. Amen, I say to that. Finally, the most lengthy but extreme informative note found in Barnes' commentary is at the end of the book of Titus. He states there the subscription was written to Titus, and it's like the other subscriptions at the close of the epistles of no authority whatever. In this subscription, there are probably two errors. Number one, in the statement that Titus was ordained the first bishop of the church of the Cretans, because number one, there's no evidence that there was a church there called the church of the Cretans. And there were many, many churches on that island. Secondly, uh, there is no evidence that Titus was the first bishop of the church there or that he was the first one there to whom might be properly applied the term bishop in the scriptural sense. Indeed, there is positive evidence that he was not the first for Paul was there with him and Titus was left there to complete what Paul had begun. And that's what an evangelist does. Set things in order, ordains elders, goes on to the next church, and takes care of churches that are without pastors and brings pastors in to pastor those churches. Thirdly, under that point, there's no evidence that Titus was a bishop there at all in the prelactical sense of the term. Prelactical meaning uh, it's characteristic of an ecclesiastical dignitary or having episcopal authority. It's a big word, but it, the point is it, it, the note is spurious. It's an error. It says, or that he was ever even settled as a pastor. Timothy nor Titus ever was. The second era is that the epistle was written from the Acropolis of Macedonia, which it says there. There is no certain evidence that it was written at Nicropolis at all. There is no reason to believe that Nicropolis referred to was even in Macedonia. These subscriptions are so utterly destitute of authority and are so full of mistakes that it's high time they were omitted in the editions of the Bible. They are, no part, they are no part of the inspired writings, but are of the nature of notes and comments, and are constantly doing something perhaps much to perpetuate error. The opinion that Timothy and Titus were prelactical bishops, the one of Ephesus and the other of Crete, that means just pastors of those churches, depends far more on these worthless subscriptions than on anything in the epistles themselves. Indeed, there is no evidence of it in the epistles and if these subscriptions were removed, no man reading from the New Testament would ever suppose that they sustained this office at all. You wouldn't get that from just reading the epistles. You get it from the note. It would seem to make more sense that in 1 Timothy 4, 5, Paul recognized that Timothy is in fact called and set apart, ordained to be an evangelist, as I already told you that he is. Paul's obviously directed by the Holy Spirit to pen this inspired letter to one of God's gifts to the church, the evangelist, Timothy. He's exhorted to make full proof of his ministry, that being the ministry of an evangelist. Many, 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 many commentators, old, older commentators, good commentators, 
would tell you the same. Now, back to our text. You've got to get the scene in your mind. Back to what we were talking about. Turn it back to uh, 2 Timothy 4. And uh, get the scene in your mind of what's taking place there. I took that little addendum to tell you to scratch that note out of your Bible if you got it in there. Now, don't scratch the Bible. I scratch the note out. Paul's about ready to die, verse 6 says. By inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he writes his final words to a fellow preacher, evangelist. And he instructs that preacher, an evangelist. And he instructs all preachers about faithfulness in the ministry and priorities in the ministry. These words are for Timothy. They are for me. They are for you as you are to understand our purpose here at the Elkdale Baptist Church. God in this text, gives Timothy a charge in verse 1. It is an order. It's a directive. The Lord through Paul tells Timothy and all preachers to be faithful in their calling. And so we are called to listen to what the preacher is called to do. We see two things. We see the basis of the charge that's given in verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God, it says. We see the basis of the charge, and we see the specifics of the charge. I want to talk to you about the basis of the charge for a little bit. I think they're still making noise up there. It is, it is based on the fact that God sees what we do. He is omnipresent. You see, the text says, I charge thee therefore, what's the next word say? Before. God. before. Look at that word before. The word before means in sight of. I charge thee therefore in sight of God. Before God. What we do in the plain sight of an omniscient God, what we do and what we say are all known to God. We don't fear that like we should, but it is indeed a fact. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36, But I say unto you that every idle word, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. You ought to stop right there and put the breath. That will make you shudder. That will make you really come down the altar and get your heart raised. Right. That's pretty heavy duty, and I'm getting closer and closer and closer to that day when I'm going to give account of my life, and so are many of you. Then you don't have to have a white head to have that happen. You, you know, young people die. Young people die. You don't have to be an old man to die. I knew a lot of friends along the course of my life, and you did too, who died at a very young age. I sure would like to have you to turn and read from Psalm 94 quite a psalm. Let's look at that psalm. Put, put, it's just a wonderful psalm. You don't read the Bible anyway, so you might as well do a little with me. Psalm, most of you, I'm, not all of you. Bless your heart, those of you who do, that doesn't ruffle you a bit. Because great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing will what? Offend them. If you're walking with God, it doesn't rattle me when a preacher preaches like that. Because I'm in the book. If you are, you wouldn't be rattled a bit. You come down here frothing at the mouth, I'll know something about you. <laughs> Psalm 94. O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth, O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. Lift up thyself, from th uh, lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth. Render a reward to the proud. This is an imprecatory prayer by David. Lord, how long... Shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? How long shall they utter and speak hard things? And all the workers of iniquity boast themselves. They break in pieces thy people, O Lord, and afflict thine heritage. And you know what the Bible says in the Proverbs? That six thing God hates, and one of them is one who sows discord amongst his children. Amen. Huh? Uh, these are, hey, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, my friend. And just a shame, people don't fear God. It says, They break in pieces thy people, O Lord, and afflict their, their, thine heritage. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fa fatherless. They're cold hearted. They don't care about anybody but themselves. They'll step on anybody, squash anybody, do whatever it takes. Yet, yet they say, The Lord shall not what? They don't believe that he's going to sin. He don't believe he's sin. And I'm afraid some of you may not. They say the Lord shall not sin, neither shall the, 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 the God of Jacob regard it. He, he, ain't going to, he ain't bothered by it. And that's what people do. Because if they really believed that it was different, they'd act a whole lot different. 
Understand, ye brutish among the people, and ye fools, when will ye be wise? He that planteth the ear, shall he not what? Hear. <laughs> he gave you an ear, you think he don't hear? He don't, he don't hear what you say in the quietness of your closet or wherever you go and say secret things. He that formed the eye, shall he not see? He that chasteneth the heathen, shall, shall not he correct? He that teacheth man knowledge, shall he not know? The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. The Lord knows every thought that you have running through your mind. If you've got wrong thoughts in your mind, he knows every one of them. Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teaches him out of thy law. The Bible says, whom the Lord loves, he what? Jesus. You violate this book, you turn your back on these principles, you live ungodly, and you have no chastening in your life, I'd really be scared. You're probably not saved. Because God, whom the Lord loves, he chasteneth, and scourges, what? Every son that he receiveth. You go astray on the Lord and you're his child, you're going to get a whooping. You don't get a whooping, you got to consider a few things. Mainly, where are you going to go when you die? That thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity, until the pit be digged for the wicked. For the Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance. Thank you, Lord. But judgment shall return unto righteousness, and all the upright in heart shall follow it. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers, or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul had almost dwelt in silence. Amen, amen. When I said, My foot slippeth, thy mercy, O Lord, held me up. Yes, thank you, Lord. In the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my soul. Shall, thy throne, shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law. They gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemn the innocent blood. But the Lord is my deliverance, and my God is the rock of my refuge. And he shall bring upon them their own iniquity and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. Yea, the Lord our God shall what? Cut them off. Cut them off. And indeed he will and does. They still going upstairs? Anybody know, Gary? No, they're done. They're done. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna be done too. Consider that psalm and think about it. We'll continue this in the next session. Let me just say this: It is true that the preacher speaks to the congregation assembled in a church auditorium, but they are not the main witness of the sermon. Some people are nervous about giving a speech in front of people, but consider this: the triune God is watching. And listening. Our Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. And that while we were sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. We're thankful, Lord, for the day when you saved many of us by your grace. Lord, help us never forget that day when you opened our eyes to your truth. That's a supernatural thing that a human being understands your word. For the natural man receiveth not the things which the Spirit of God, their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. Thank you for those here tonight who love your word, who have the Spirit of God who will respond favorably to your word. I pray I've been a help to these, my friends, and my brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray, Lord, that we would walk closer to you, each and every one of us. We all need you to draw us near unto yourself and help us, Lord, <coughs> to do your will. We don't naturally do that in our flesh. So we pray, again, that we would, as your word says, that you would work in us to will and do of your good pleasure. We ask and pray in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. And you're dismissed.